Greeting. Hello again, lovies. <laughs> it's David McGillivray here, horror icon and comedy legend, and I'm here with another edition of Little Did You Know the Chat Show, in which I talk to people I find interesting, and I hope you agree with me. And I also tend to mention Patreon, or indeed Patreon. I still haven't worked out how to pronounce it. And this is the point where it comes up here. There's a little banner that's added. That's the link to Patreon for those of you who are generous enough to spare us a few coppers to keep us going. You know how it is. You may have found a few coins down the side of the sofa. You might not know what to do with them. I'll say no more because my guest is ready and waiting. She is, I believe, a record holder. Now, according to my calculations, she's been in the film business for 77 years. She may want to correct us on that. And she is also, I believe, the oldest continuity girl in the world. And not only that, but she's still working. How about that? Will you please say hello to the very wonderful Rennie Glynn. <laughs> there she is, Rennie. And um, Rennie was kind enough to point out to me earlier how to pronounce her name. And as she says, it's Rennie as in the indigestion tablet, right. not, not Renee, even though there's an accent on the first E. So why are you Rennie and not Renee, Rennie? two reasons one i was embarrassed throughout my whole childhood at school to be renee so i was Rini, which was awful and then on a film set for while the sunshine shines um, michael allen french actor introduced me to what was going to be my husband but was just a visitor on the set and he said this is rennie because he's French, he didn't do the René, thank goodness. And so from that moment on, I was René. My parents had to change to call me René. They found it very difficult, but they were lovely and they did it. And I'm particularly delighted that for this episode, you have chosen to wear your signature beret. <laughs> Um, those of us who know Rennie know that she is seldom without it. I want to know the, the history of this as well, Rennie. When did you first start wearing this headgear? Uh, for interviews, but mainly to keep my ears warm and not wear my dreadful on the set um, helmets because I always needed my head covered. What that was a sort of a, a turban, was it, or a headscarf? No, no, no. It would be um, uh, like a fisherman, a Greek fisherman's cap, or a snow helmet. The beret is very much you, Rennie. How many of them do you have? I think ten or twelve at the moment, <laughs> and I'm I'm still looking. And are they all in black? Half of them are black. Of them are, black. I, I do do try occasionally, but it doesn't last long. We're loving the, the look, Rene. I nearly said Rene there, didn't I? Rene. Uh, some of us have style and some don't. Now, I'm looking at the room behind you. I need to know about that. Is it a Chinese cabinet? It is a Chinese cabinet, which is very tall. And my mother made it into two, whereby I have two, one each side of the room now, because the ceilings in modern houses, even though this is 1919 house, are lower than when these Chinese cabinets were imported from China to England. I have seen cabinets like that in museums. You are very fortunate indeed uh, to have one. And what is this room, Rennie? Is it your living room? Well, it's, it's my everything room. It's a bit, it's a bit of everything. I, now, mean, I, I, I could swing the, the thing around and show you the length of it. It's two rooms 
with the wall knocked down now. So it's a bit my everything. I see. Now, let's get down to business. How about those statements I, I made at the beginning of the show, Rennie? Are they true? What do you reckon? 77 years in the business? That sounds about right. <laughs> Incredible. And is it fair to call you the oldest continuity girl in the world? No, because I don't know whether that's true. Fair. I mean, I'm hoping it's true, but I really don't know. You must be in the top 10, really. <laughs> I mean, saying things like this means that I have to ask you a very personal question and ask, how old are you? Mm. Well, I shall be 95 in next year in August. I like that number better than the one I am at the moment, you see. My goodness. And it, it is true that you are still working, aren't you? I am, yeah. There's the, I happen to know, viewers, that there's a, there's a film student in Rennie's house right at this minute. She, uh, she helped uh, set this interview up and she's part of a, a house full of film students. And Rennie has just appeared in a documentary about herself made by one of her neighbour film students. We're going to talk about that at the end of the show. But first of all, we need to know, well, I mean, I say we need to know, almost everybody watching this programme will know that uh, one job of a continuity girl is to make sure that if an actor has a drink, then the liquid doesn't go down, down, and then go back up again, and then and if there's a ciggy on, it doesn't go down to the end, and then suddenly it's a full length again. This is the sort of thing that happens because, of course, there are multiple takes. So continuity girls, and indeed boys now, have to watch out for that sort of thing. But I happen to know that's not all uh, a continuity girl has to do. Am I, am I right, Rennie? Oh, totally. I mean, that's just one, one facet of it. And <clears throat> I can tell you what all, all the other things are quite quickly, if you'd like to hear. Mm. Okay. Um, you get asked to do the film, you agree to do the film, you get sent the script, you time the script, you circulate your timing to every department, if there, is a, if there is a department at that point, and they base their schedule, their costume changes, the prop things on our synopsis. So <clears throat> come the beginning of shooting, well, rehearsals, we can't, don't, we don't always get to round the table rehearsals. But anyway, you start to shoot and you, you're, you're there at 8.30 standing by on the first day thinking you're gonna die. And then you look round at everybody else and they're in a worse state than oneself. So for slate one, scene 25, because we shoot in consecutive slate numbers in England. I had to learn to shoot in scene numbers when I did Hollywood locations which initially was very foreign to me but of course got used to it anyway um one of the big spe specific things that we have to do is take certain notes so that we know slate number scene number good take bad take lens on camera focal distance f-stop and for every single setup, we have to note that. It can be in a notebook, it can be on the left-hand page in your script, but it has to be forwarded at the end of every single day to the editor so that he's it got on paper virtually day's work. It sounds, it sounds like a, a, a very responsible job indeed. I want to talk about this later as well. But uh, first things first, I'm talking about a continuity girl. I mean, you never hear that term anymore. They're no. script supervisors. But what do you prefer? Well, no, I, I call myself scriptos, but not, I mean, not working. I mean, that's just in my, my own life. But we are now script supervisors, 
we were continuity girls and Tilly Day, who was a very famous one, was 70, which I thought was very, very old at the time. Of course, now I think it's quite young. And she was a continuity girl. Then um, we got called, we, we, we went straight from continuity girl to script supervisor. But in France, it's just called the script or le, 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 le script. Um, Italy, it's um, whatever it is, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, for, uh, schinothetis, I think. Anyway, it's it's something else. It isn't word for script. Um, and now we are we we we're definitely definitely script supervisor. Okay, well, we're going to go uh, right back to the uh, beginning, uh, Rennie, and uh, do correct me if I get any of these facts wrong, but uh, I believe that you were evacuated during the war. You went to Wellin Garden City, which uh, was the second garden city in the UK, and because of that, you ended up at Wellin Studios. You were a trainee, a junior reader in the uh, script of Department and gradually worked your way up the ladder to continuity. First of all, you were a production secretary and you were working on some very big films indeed. Titles we'll still know today Brief Encounter, it's back on television at the moment, Caesar and Cleopatra. Um, uh, who are the famous names you remember from this period in the, uh, the mid 40s, Rennie? Well, Claude Rains, Vivian Lee. Trevor Howard, Celia Johnson. Um, who did you who did you meet one day in the corridor? Aha. So I was 18 and I was at Denham Studios visiting with my boss, who was Guido Cohen of Two Cities Films. And this extraordinary character approached from a distance because it's almost a mile long, the Denham corridor. Anyway, I thought that's an extraordinary looking gentleman. Um, he was, he had a, a blue leather waistcoat on, no shirt, hairy arms, hairy chest, jodhpurs, leather, I think, boots, and wild, wonderful, black, silver mane of hair. Anyway, I didn't expect him to acknowledge me, but he stopped and kind of almost grabbed me and said, like, who are you? What are you doing here? What's your ambition? And I didn't, I had no idea who he was. Who was he, Rennie? He was Gabriel Pascal, who, <laughs> Hungarian, who was at that very moment doing a year's prep on Caesar and Cleopatra. And I was there visiting two cities films, Laurence Olivia doing Hamlet. <clears throat> anyway, the, the, the Gabby dragged me into Del Gradice's doorway and said you know I want this girl to work for me and I turned if I could move my head because he was holding me by my hair um, and I said I, I, I don't know who you are I, I, I don't know who you are and they both guffawed of course and then told me who he was and I still said but I work for you Mr. Del Fidice, and I'm very happy and you know I, I don't want to change <laughs> anyway uh, Gabby's secretary rang me in the office of Two Cities every single day for a week saying, Gabby is driving me insane. He must have you work on his film. So I discussed it with the Two Cities and my mother and everybody said, don't do it, don't do it. So off I went to do it. And I did it. And you, you, you met the author of uh, Caesar and Cleopatra as well. Uh, oh, um, um, oh, oh. Uh, it was to the manor born, but what an honor and what a joy. One of my jobs was like being a messenger virtually. It was taking a piece of revision script to George Bernard Shaw in his apartment in Pall Mall. And he was always out when I got there having his afternoon walk. And his, um, his housekeeper used to make me a cup of tea and a cake or something and he'd come home and he'd say have, have, you, have you given this girl is what he called me um tea and stuff and she'd say yes and then he'd read this amendment and either go crazy or think it's wonderful 
hand it back to me. I would then go home for the night and the next day trot off like I did to Mumford's farm, which is Chalfonts and Peter. Uh, tube train, bus, walk uh, up the hill to the farm and take this precious piece of script of which there's no other copy. If I got kidnapped or lost it, it would be disaster. Anyway, I survived a year of that. Well, I, I said earlier, Rennie, it, this is a, a very responsible job. Um, it, it sounds to me as though it's one of the most responsible jobs on the entire studio floor. We think so. <laughs> <laughs> we suffer, not we think so, we suffer so. Because if you, if you make a mistake, you cost the film company thousands of pounds for retakes. The only mistakes I've ever made were during take one, I would see something and you, you, we're not allowed to say cut, but whisper to the director. But I never ever, there is not one mistake ever made or retake necessary from my years. So the, the protocol is that if you notice something, so let's say in take one, um, the actor uses his right hand to pull oh, oh. the and then, uh, Yes, that sort of thing. In, in take two, he, he uses another hand. So then you have to whisper to the director. That's the protocol, is it? Yes. But the thing is, if it's his fault, you know, the, the actors do wrong things, but that is their fault. But if I suddenly see I've let an actor not have his tie on or something like that, at the worst, at the you know the worst, I would notice it as it was the clapper going in on tape one, and I you can't you we can't say cut or even whisper till it's over. That that you know that was no good. Sorry. <laughs> how, how did you know before you started the job, Rennie, that you had an aptitude for it? Because it sounds to me like a very specific skill. One doesn't know. I mean, you have to love drama. You have to be a shorthand typist, um, and a, and a, a mini, mini artist who can draw a little bit, and a strong bladder um, is very, very important. And want to be in the center, you know, center of attraction, as it were, because everybody comes to you. You're sitting on your little stool by the camera and the props come and the wardrobe come and the makeup comes and the actor comes. And I was kind of attracted to that job when I went on the floor, just visiting or having to give a message at Welling. So, I, I mean, I didn't know that that's what I wanted to do. I didn't, didn't think I wanted to be an ASM in the theater, which would be the nearest thing to it. But I knew I wanted to do something, something theatrical, because my family is was musicians and such likes. Um, I, I've asked this question of other script supervisors. I'll, I'll ask it of you as well, Rennie. Why back in those days were there no continuity boys? There's a big reason because we had to do shorthand and typing, and boys did not do that in America the system is right written. And so they were all men originally. Aha, well, that makes a sense. Now, I want to talk to you about the, um, the first film that you were uh, credited for as um, uh, continuity. And that was a film called The Brass Monkey in 1948. I'm sure you'll remember it. It interests me because it starred a prototype of um, Simon Cowell, um, a talent spotter called Carol Levis. He was also a healer, he said, and I used to have headaches at that time, almost like sinus headaches, and he, he did a, a this to me, and I never had another headache of that sort ever again. That is extraordinary, Rennie, because I worked with an actress who said she had the same gift. I used to have migraines in those days. She did that to me 
it went like that. Now, what do you make of that? Uh, there are a lot. There are many people that say they can do that for, for sufferers, but I don't think it works. I, I, I don't. I don't know what you know what they have at all. Some people can do it. Some people mm -hmm. apparently can't. Um, yes. So the the brass monkey. Exciting times uh, on this very responsible job. Or was it just by now just a job? No, no, it's never been a job. Um, on Brass Monkey, I was still clutching a cushion to my stomach at rushes with fear that I might see something that you know I, I shouldn't see. But then um, Polaroid cameras got invented, and that alleviated a lot. And then video assist alleviates a lot, but it's still uh, it's still the same job and and none of that helps in certain circumstances it's just what what you've written you know what you've written or what you know and you still have to have an eye you can't and, replace that can you no and i don't have a photographic memory i just have a system which we all have a you know had a, a system which makes me know everything but it's it's not it's not memory it it's uh, my memory is jerked to check that 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 is is a, a form of uh, not talent but uh, give me the word the gift gift thank you yes yeah have yeah. you have you ever counted the number of films you've worked on Rennie? I haven't, but I'm told it's about 140. But then there are a lot, a lot more that I've just done a week on or a couple of days. But one, 140 actual credits, I believe. I bet it's a lot more than that, Rennie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, the reason I say that is that a lot of these films we're talking about, and that is from the 1940s and 1950s, turn up now on a channel called Talking Pictures. Oh, isn't that wonderful, though? Your name, your name is up there virtually every week. And now I expect it to be on every film, and of course it's not. It's on a hell of a lot, Rennie. Do you enjoy watching your old films? Yeah, I do very much. Yeah, very, very much. And and there was there's one film which now I can't even think think of the title, but I will. Um, and I did it at Twickenham. That I had a wonderful time on. Um, it was the first time I'd worked with. Oh God. Uh, Henry, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to me as well, Rennie. What sort of a film was it? Was it a musical? It was no. It was a drama. It was a drama. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll talk about it later if I may, and it'll come to me. You certainly can. But I know you. You. You happen to have watched a fairly recent film that has come back called um, "What a Crazy World," I think. Yes, and some of the shots in that are a bit of. A, you know, surprise to me, I've forgotten them. Mostly when I watch films I've worked on, I know where I sat for it. I know whether it, the, the shot was a, a problem and it's clear. And, and the story I wanted to tell you was one film the other night a couple of months ago, which I'd had a wonderful time filming, but I didn't recognize the story or the location or even some of the actors, which is very, very strange. That, that, that's the story that I wanted to tell. And it happens, yes. Girl, Girl in the Headlines, it was called. Girl in the Headlines, I remember it, yes. Thank you, Talking Pictures. Um, we're, going to take, we're going to take a break now because we always like to hear from our hosts, Peccadillo Pictures. They want to tell us about one of their new films. Have a look at this, please, but then join us again in a couple of minutes. See you soon. Twelve 
een voorlang is echt de dokters waren naar haar geweest. De moeder hebben ze hier gevonden. En daar zat de vader vast, aan die leiding. We vermoeden dat de dader het kind heeft meegenomen toen hij wegvluchtte. We willen enkel weten of ik hier een jongetje gezien heb van een jaar of negen. Mogelijk gewoon. Drie mensen drie dagen vasthouden, dat is gecontroleerd en dat is geplant. Heel die verdwijningszaak heeft veel van wat er mee bloem gebeurd is. Ik zou niet willen dat dat mee meer aan de haal gaat dan dat is. Ik weet hoe ver dat je altijd gaat. In een kort zult je de zuivere waarheid kennen. Welcome back. I'm uh, David McGillivray, and today on uh, this edition of Little Did You Know, my guest is Continuity Girl Supreme, Rennie Glynn. Now, we've got to talk about your career, Rennie, and uh, in the 1950s, you became involved with uh, some of the films you're best remembered for. These are the films the fans like to talk about because you were involved in a lot of uh, productions from Exclusive, which later became Hammer Film Productions. Um, you remember these very fondly, don't you? I do. Even PC-49 and Celia, I mean, they, they were radio radio spin-offs and I, and I loved them. I loved every moment of Exclusive and Hammer time. What's so special about this company, Rennie? Was it was it that it was like working with a family? Yeah, it was the lo loyalty and familiarity, and you know that that, that and and very very hard work. Very, uh, and or or, or 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 terrible journey to work or living on the job, which was really nice from Monday to Friday night and dining together, playing snooker, going on the river, all that. Now, I, I know you, 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 you still appear at a, a great number of uh, conventions and festivals and, and, and what have you. What are the sort of, uh, that, was, uh, that was an alert from my computer that we can ignore. I think I'll start that again. Uh, um, I know, Renny, you go to a lot of festivals and conventions and that sort of thing. And uh, what what are the questions that the fans like to ask you about Hammer films? Because I mean, ironically, you weren't involved in the in the famous no. Gothic productions, were you? And I, I, you know, I used to always say that I left because I didn't really want to do that. I thought they were beneath my dignity, of course, at the time. And now I think they're absolutely wonderful. And I did have to go back on the odd day or week on those gothics, but I, I, I didn't want to do one and they didn't dare ask me to. Did you think they were cheap and sensational? Yeah, yeah I did. I, at the time I did, definitely, definitely. But you worked on some of the science fiction productions, didn't you? I, I would do drama, science fiction, musical, anything, but not them. What do the fans ask you about those films? Uh, who's your favourite actor? <laughs> who's your favourite? And, and then, and again, who's your favourite actor? They they don't ask in the in the audience. They don't ever ask anything very bright. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said it, Rennie. Um, one to one, you know, they're all wonderful and brilliant. Yes, it is. It is marvelous to know they're all out there. Um, I, I'm a bit of a demon, Rennie, and I like talking about 
really bad films and and so i i want to talk to you about a film from this period that i'm i'm hoping it's not going to send chills up your spine because it's one of my favorite films and i know it it is the favorite of a, a lot of people i'm building up the tension here um uh i bet people are going to know which one i'm talking about it's it's fire maidens from outer space now do you remember it it looks to me as though it was enormous fun to work on because it was such a mess am i right yeah no you're right in in every way but i mean it was kind of a tragedy that was the only problem the the the, the fun of it was that it was so awful and we felt kind of guilty for it being made at all did you know it, it, it was as bad as it turned out to be while you were making it? Yeah, I, I knew because the camera crew were the particular wits of the time. And so I, I became, well, I had to keep my counsel more than they did, actually. I mean, they used to burst out laughing and not be able to shoot, but I, I, I couldn't have done that. Wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't. Well, in, in case you hadn't seen it, I'm, I'm on record uh, as having said that in, in, in my view, it's, it's up there with Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's, it's the British Plan 9 from Outer Space. It, it must absolutely not be missed. And now you know that Rennie did the continuity. You've got to seek it out. I'm telling you that. I'll say, I'll say no more. Um, from Fire Maidens um, uh, from Outer Space, let, let's move on to uh, another film that was alleged uh, to be chaos, and, and that's because it had so many directors. Now, what is the truth? What was going on on the first version of Casino Royale? Well, it, it went to plan because it was epi episodic, and each director and cast were a separate issue but it it didn't link together and they didn't know what to do with it and they brought Val Guest in to do an episode and to do link shots and because Val I mean I worked with Val Guest uh, always a lot I mean always when I was free and he could have me um, and he asked for me and he got me. And so I, the first stuff with him was not the episode, but the, a few link shots. And I met David Niven and Lois Maxwell on my first day's shooting, I seem to remember. And cameraman Tony Richmond, who was a, a very young, ambitious, on the way up, to where he got to fame and fortune and gorgeous guy that he is. So it, it, it was just wonderful shooting on it. Woody Allen was kind of difficult, but not difficult with me. And that was a great experience. And, and, the, and to do the finale was, if I think about it, meeting George Raft and John, Jean, Jean Paul Belmondo and and all the people that I hadn't worked with, but George Raff was my hero actor from Bolero when I was 13. My father took me to see it and I, I, can, I can still feel the, the sitting there in the cinema with him. Oh, what a thrill. Now we, we must move from one extreme uh, to the other because around this time, uh, you, you moved into a, another phase of your career um sex exploitation films now it turns out that that Rennie and I were involved in a, in a, a couple of the same productions we didn't know at the time but i'm thinking about a film directed by john hamill called doing the best i can and this film was being filmed itself for an episode of a series called man alive and it's called exploitation um, now, alas, this film that uh, you worked on, uh, John Hamill's film, was never finished. So what was going wrong with that production? Well, all I know is that the, 
the makeup man threw a chair out of John Hamill's flat or the other way around, but I can't remember. And, and that was the last straw. I don't know. I guess he ran out of money. That was probably what really finished it. Um, it was taken very seriously, all the shooting. I, th I think it was the, the running out of money and it must have been the makeup man throw, throwing the chair out the window, I guess. Um, it, was very, it was very hot stuff, wasn't it? Did it weren't there well, sort of two... Well, it, it was it, no, it was all it was all simulated, but then clear the set set boys and the handheld camera stayed and they finished making love every time. And there was not one um, episode girl that didn't. I guess they were asked before whether they would and they did. Well, well I knew them all as they all became my friends. <laughs> well, it's a great shame that we'll never be able to see doing the best I can, but you can see doing the best I can being filmed with with um, me and Rennie because I think it's on YouTube. Oh, I, well, I went to try and find it the other day and it said, you know, not there. And I think you were 23 and I was about 38 or something. It's all true. It's all I true. Think that, 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 realization for me is like was quite magic but may, may I just tell a little story that when they came to film and I was behind the camera uh, I get my usual funny look on the face which is sort of oh my god and they panned onto me onto big close-up which is in the film and all the Greek Cypriots in um, around King's Cross cafe where I used to go to my accountants once a year thought that, that all I ever did was work on soft porn and n nothing I could say could stop them. They, they told their friends and I used to go to nightclubs and I'd see them, Greek nightclubs, and they would, you know, oh, yeah, oh, we know what you do. It was, it was just an era and it yeah. passed and uh, your career carried on uh, regardless and it included one last quite terrible film that I'm determined to bring up. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> Go on, what am I going to say, Rennie? It's Cannibal. It is Cannibal, with a K. This is a favourite film of our mutual friend, uh, Jonathan Rigby. He said, you've got to see this film. And all I can say is, it wasn't a disappointment. And this is the work of a remarkable man called Richard Driscoll, who also stars in the film and obviously saw himself as Anthony Hopkins. Um, what are your memories of Mr. Driscoll, Rennie? Well, we were very, very close on the prep. He lived in Radlett, which is very near here. And I was there, not, not every, every day, but many, many days just looking at the script, not really working. We, we were very real friends. And during the production, we were, you know, we were still friends. Um, some of the acting was not good enough or not good, but it, it, it works as a film. I mean, it's, it's kind of awful in an exploitive way, but it's still a piece of film. You're too kind, Rennie. This is why everybody loves you. You haven't got a bad thing to say about every, anyone. That's very kind of you. I have bad thoughts, though. Oh, oh good. <laughs> she, she's not perfect. Well, no. it's another film. I don't want to tell you too much about it, but all I can say is that uh, Hunt It Out, it's a remarkable film. You won't have seen anything like it, apart from Fire Maidens from Outer Space. Now, you're still going, as we established, and uh, uh, currently, or you, you've just finished... Um, making a documentary um, and this is made by uh, your neighbours who are film students. So how did this come about, Rennie? I know them very casually over the, over the garden fence and one of them who I least knew, knew because she's Polish and during this pandemic she's been in Poland and couldn't get back. Anyway, she 
needed to do um, a documentary because she's on a documentary course for her graduation film. And so suddenly she said in the middle of a moment when we were all together, had this idea that I'd really like to do a day in the life of over the fence. I'm not sure what I mean. Um, uh, the, the, this interesting person who lives next door, or this stranger, and she was like rambling on about what it was going to be but anyway it was me and so I said oh yes of course of course I'm anybody's practically and we shot we shot for three days and they came to Bayswater Road with me me hanging my paintings going in the cafe and all over the house and all over the harrow on the hill and there's narration to be done later apart from that they've got five hours worth of I call it film, but it isn't film, um, for a 20 minute documentary. And that, that's how it is today. And I'm still a little bit old school thinking that's a bit, you know, you, you know you're not going to be able to use that material. Why, why are you shooting it? Do you enjoy talking about yourself, Rennie? Nothing better. Ah, Great, so this is not an ordeal then. No, this is, this is my idea of heaven. Oh, how sweet. We can't wait to see that film. And uh, when it's ready, and who knows when that'll be, and we've got a title, I shall inform everybody on this, oh. on this very show. Um, now, you just mentioned uh, paintings there, and that brings us on to your dual career, because... Uh, Every so often until recently, you could be found against railings in Bayswater. Why was that, Rennie? Rain or, shine, rain or shine every Sunday. So when I stopped accepting films because I got to a point where the films offered to me were blockbusters out east, and I was, you know, a bit, bit beyond wanting to do that, or film students, films for no money. And I thought I can't do either of these. I, I just am not going to. So I said, I don't work or I don't accept films anymore. But because work is a hobby virtually, um, I had to think of something which was very difficult, as difficult as continuity, more so and it was to paint so i just went to some art class art sessions there weren't really classes um and i started painting and found a bit that i could paint and my friend pamela plant who was the wife of larry noble actor was on bayswater road forever and on Sundays I used to actually socially go and visit her with my children or my mother or it was my Sunday outing anyway she said oh, why don't you come on the road and I said oh I can't show these paintings that I've done and she said oh yes you can and of course I did and that's you know 20 years on I'm still there how many paintings have you sold Rennie I suppose 200 but not at the moment Oh my goodness, and what style do you paint in? Well, I think I'm, I'm a turn of the century impressionist. <laughs> That's what I like doing. I can't, I can do likenesses to a degree, but, you know, they're not very exciting, I don't think. But I want, I, I just want to tell stories, really. And apart from that, you also pass on your skills to students, don't you? Which skills? <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant continuity. No, I, yeah, I, well, I did, in the old days, we had assistants who learnt, you know, on the job. And then I did teach or coach, uh, teach coach for back to ACTT, as it were. Um, yeah, I did that once I stopped being on the floor and was doing art classes at, at around that point. And that was wonderful because I had to go on 
film locations and studios at 11 in the morning, leave about three in the afternoon to watch my or our trainees actually at work and speak to the continuity about how they're doing. So I saw old friends, new friends and left and I could have a dog. So my, my, my original Spartacus used to come with me and dogs were allowed in the studio, if not on the set, so he could stay in the car occasionally. But anyway, it was, it was, that was very nice time. We and that came to an end, that, that system of training came to an end. We can't finish this uh, conversation, Renny, without talking about uh, dogs. Uh, how many have you had? I've only had two. They're both, they're both called Spartacus. Yes, one was Spart Spartacus with a C, and this one is Spartacus. And you're often seen out together, aren't you? Yes, I'm seen more or less woman, you know, woman with dog um, everywhere, everywhere. He, he, he comes to Cinema Museum and he barks. When there's applause, he barks. And the compares for... Uh, the yearly, yearly, uh, I can't think who they are, awards, always includes him uh, in their comic um, introductions. So it's, I mean, I, I, the Cinema Museum, who used to have a cat, were always a bit worried about the original Spartacus, but they, you know, they put up with me and him. Whenever the Cinema Museum uh, reopens, you must go down there, everyone. Meet Rennie and Spartacus, and it's a wonderful I hope so. I hope so. as well. And unique. There is nothing else like it in, in the country. Um, just en passant, uh, uh, Rennie, uh, how, how are your uh, memoirs going? It's best, best, not, best not mentioned. Uh, they're, still, they're, they're still on tape. Uh, un, 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 un edited, edited completely, and you know it's it's a, a terror. It's a very bad story which we won't go into. But I'll I'll do it another way with somebody else another time for sure. Your story must be told, uh, Rennie. Um, part of it can be read on your website, and that's rennieglynn.com. You can have a look at that uh, in just a moment. And uh, you can also, some of you, go on to Patreon, because this conversation is continuing there. But for now, alas, for everybody on YouTube, this is where we have to part because we've run out of time, alas. Rennie, thank you so much for being with us. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, as I always do. David, thank you so much. Really, thank you. It's always such fun. And uh, right now, from me, uh, David McGillivray, thank you very much for joining me. Join me again at the same time next week. I'll have another guest for you. He or she will be just as delightful as Rennie Glynn, I can promise you. Until then, from me, bye-bye. <laughs>